on July 7th, 2009, I was getting ready to take a trip back to Utah to remarry my now ex-wife. As I was leaving, I had a premonition not to go. I didn't listen. My father, who was standing there on the grass because I was borrowing his car, had the exact same premonition. Tell him not to go. Stop him. He didn't do it. I went anyways. This was about 6.30. So as I was going up to Valencia to grab some stuff that I had in storage up there to go up to Utah. I was in uh, Sun Valley going down the only car on Glen Oaks, just me. And I see a mile away, one van. So it's just me and this van. I'm coming down the street doing exactly, I remember, looking at the 45 miles an hour. I'm doing 45 miles an hour. He's getting closer, but he's doing little movements. I'm like, what's he playing chicken with me? I can't believe he's doing this. So I just tried to keep an eye on him, but keep an eye on the road. No one else is on it. So I keep going 45 miles an hour, foot's firmly on the gas. And as soon as I get about 50 feet away from him, he does this. So I do this to try to move. I hit him 45 miles an hour through the van, four lanes over onto the sidewalk. There was five children and two adults in the van. None of them were hurt. I had my entire right leg shattered from the hip all the way down. So they had to replace hip, femur, knee, fibia, tibia, ankle and three ribs broke and stuck into my lung, which they kept in, I don't know why. So I was in a bad accident and I remember thinking, saying out loud, I've just been in a bad accident. At that point, the driver comes stumbling over and he puts his head in, all the windows are blown out, front window, side windows, everything. He puts his head in the window and he's like, Morte? M M Morte? I go, no, I'm not dead. Go get help. So he goes stumbling off. I think he's going to get help. Actually, he went home and took a shower and got a beer and waited for the police to call. So I see I'm trying to stay, you know, awake and conscious of everything that's going on. And I see the passenger woman get into the driver's seat and I'm like, oh no, this is gonna be a mess. And then I started to think, I might die. There's nobody around. I can't get I can't reach my cell phone. It was on the ground. Everything that was on my seat is on the ground. I looked over and there was a man standing looking in the window, a different man. Very nice looking guy, <laughs> dark hair, shoulder length really white shirt. He said, Michael, how are you? I said, I, I'm fine. I go, am I going to die? He goes, no, you're not going to die. He goes, is there anything I can do for you? I said, yeah, could you pick that stuff up off the floor? I don't know why I asked him to, but I did. So he did. He goes, yes, of course. And he picked up my cell phone and all the other effects that I had that had been thrown onto the floor, put them on the passenger seat. He goes, you're going to be all right. And he reached out his, his arm and I took it and he kept rubbing my, my arm. He said, you're going to be all right. You're not going to die. You're not going to die. I said, okay, okay, okay. All right. Just stay with me. He goes, I'll stay with you until uh, help comes. I said, okay, I feel a lot better. He goes, okay, fine. I'll stay with you. And that was it. He just kept small talk, nothing, uh, just kept holding on to me. And that, that gave me all the comfort I needed. Then he said, help's here. I'm going to go. Remember, you're not going to die. 
you'll be fine. I said, okay, thank you. And he walked behind, right, right by the police officer who came up, stuck his head in the window and he said, how are you? I go, well, thanks to that guy you just passed, a lot better. He goes, what guy? I'm the only one here. I go, the guy with the white shirt and dark hair. He goes, there's nobody here but me, you, and the people in that van. I'm like, well, then how did all the stuff that was on the floor get on the seat? He's like, I go, he did it. He goes, there's nobody here. I go, well, I couldn't do it. He goes, obviously, you can't move. You're pinned in there. I go, where's help? Because you're no help. <laughs> You're starting to scare me, because I it's it had been about tw at least a half hour, going on a half hour. As soon as I said that, I could hear the sirens, and the ambulance was there, and the police officer started to question me, what happened? I said this guy pulled in front of me. He goes, there's only a woman. I go, there was a guy in there. He's he left. He goes, are you sure that's not the guy you're talking to? I'm like, no the guy I was talking to was drunk and fat and then they hit me with morphine <laughs> and that was the end of it so now I'm in the hospital I need three surgeries to fix my right leg the major surgery being the complete replacement of my right hip the second one in my knee third one on my ankle Thursday, I was brought in on a Tuesday. They explained everything Wednesday. I agreed, I had to. Because <laughs> they said, either that or we amputate your leg. And I said, absolutely not. I'll go for the surgery. So Thursday, they did the most complicated and it went very smooth. So I was feeling pretty good about this. Second surgery was a knee. That's an easy one. So they scheduled that for seven o'clock Saturday morning. So I was nervous because they were only giving me a day or two to, to uh, recover, but I figured they knew what they were doing. Saturday morning, uh, everybody comes in and the anesthesiologist made a mistake and put on the wrong mask. He was supposed to put one on that would let out any fluids that might come up. He didn't because he didn't check to see what I ate or when I ate. So that's very important. So after the surgery, they closed up, surgeon left, and I was coming out of the anesthetic and I aspirated, vomited, stayed in the mask and I sucked it back in down into my lungs and they weren't prepared for that. They're supposed to be, but they weren't. So code blue was called because my heart and my breathing had stopped, obviously. Only one nurse was in the room at the time and that's when I flatlined for three minutes, 58 seconds. So I started to rise, come out of my body, my spirit. And I could look down and see my body thinking, wow, that looks bad. But I started to go up in an angle towards the corner of the uh, operating room, which I thought was odd, but I, that's what happened and I continued up and I then I looked back again to see if I could see anything like my, anybody I knew but I just saw people running in like and then I was through the ceiling so I get through the ceiling and it's pitch black but I could feel motion like I was still moving up and moving up and I couldn't see anything it was the blackest black I've ever experienced, but I could feel like I was a part of the, of the black, of the, the area I was in, like 
my spirit was a part of this dark matter. So I wasn't afraid, so I knew I wasn't <laughs> heading anywhere bad. I was just wondering what was it gonna what was gonna happen because I was told by my friend at the accident I wasn't gonna die. And this looked like death. Right then my grandfather popped up. This is my father's father. My father was working a lot when I was young. So his father, who was retired at that time, would uh, take me everywhere. He'd take me to baseball games, he'd take me hiking, camping, fishing. He was my father, basically, as I was growing up in my youth, uh, till I was about 12 years old. And then my dad tried to, you know, be more of a participating father, but my, my grandfather was there for me as I was growing up and a big part of my uh, spiritual growth. So it makes sense that he would appear to me. So he did, he appears to me. I go, granddad, am I dead? He goes, no, you haven't finished your work on the earth. I'm like, what haven't I done? He goes, you covenanted with the Lord to do a certain thing. You haven't even yet begun to do that. I go, what is that? And he would tell me. He told me three times what it was. I said, but I thought I've been doing that. He goes, you haven't even started it. You have to start doing it immediately. All this time, because I've been back to church, no more band for 10 years and I thought I was on the straight and narrow path and apparently I was not. So he told me, and, and this is all thought, this is at the speed of thought, no talking. And the first time and the only time I saw him during the 3 minute 58 second flat line, I st would start to look behind him because I could see shapes. And when I would do that, he would notice, and then he would speak my name, which sounded like a thunderclap, scared me. And then I'd like, okay, what? And then he'd say it again, and say it again. And basically, it's to go back and help people learn about Christ. People that already think they know, and people that don't know, but mainly people that are already are in church to get them to focus on what's really important, which isn't socializing and all that stuff. It's Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, you're right, I haven't been doing that. <laughs> Not like I should. So that was it. He was done speaking. I said, so I'll see you again. Yes. And that was it. I opened my eyes and it had been three months. I'd been in a coma. Because I got, I had a pneumonia due to the aspiration. And I was in a coma, but when I came out, I was very, I was gonna, wasn't gonna make it. So they put me in a medically induced coma and kept trying to take the stuff out of my lungs more and more and more as, as much as they could manually and then kept me in a coma for three months. Also putting me in a bed of ice because the air conditioning in the hospital, I just remember this, failed and my temperature rose so fast that they had to run out and get buckets of ice and throw them on me until the air conditioning was fixed in the hospital. I don't know, I don't remember any of this because I was in a coma, so. But I heard all this from my parents and it was very hard on them because the doctor said he's got a 15% chance of living. And if he does, he's gonna be disabled and he won't be able to walk, he won't be able to take care of himself. And they told that to my wife and uh, she left me. She divorced me and sold my house, our house and took off because she said, couldn't be married to a disabled man. And I am dis I'm disabled, but I can walk, I can do everything. 
they were wrong. And uh, that's why I'm here and able to do these things because of uh, my faith in Jesus Christ.